So that's the end of talking about ionic compounds. The next type of co compound we talked about were the binary molecular compounds. Binary meaning two, and molecular. These aren't ions. So we decided that binary molecular compounds have two nonmetal elements. If you see a metal, it's going to be an ionic compound. These do not have metals in them. In a molecular compound, we have molecules, not formula units. Um, we do have a particular order that we list the elements in, in compounds. And here is that specific order, C-P-N-H-S-I-B-R-C-L-O-F. I would not spend much time memorizing that. I just really wouldn't. Um, in my book, it's not a big deal, and I'm not going to test you on it specifically for sure. It has to do with um, an idea called electronegativity, but um, an easier way for you to remember or decide which element comes first, the more metallic one comes first. And that's basically what this order is doing. Like if we're going to have a compound between nitrogen and oxygen, we look on the periodic table, and we learned a periodic trend, right? The elements to the left are more metallic than the elements to the right. Nitrogen is to the left of oxygen. It's more metallic. It's not a metal, but it's more like a metal than oxygen is, and so it goes first. It's more like the man, right? The guy goes first when we're addressing the pair of them together. Um, so when we, when we write the formulas for these, there is a particular order. The first element is named just as an element. It's just a plain old element name. The name of the second element um, is named like it was an ion. It changes its ending to "-ide". It's not an ion, but it still changes the ending. And then because we don't have any charges here to tell us how many of each from the name, we use prefixes to indicate the numbers. So we use the Greek prefixes, um, and here's the table. You need to know these. Some of them you probably already know. Mono means one, di means two, tri means three. You know, how many sides does a triangle have? Three, right? Tri means three. Tetra, that one might be a little different. Are you familiar with the game Tetris? How many little squares are in each of those shapes in Tetris? Four. And each of the little squares has four sides. There's a meaning behind the name Tetris. Tetris means four. So Tetris four, penta, how many sides in a pentagon? Five. A hexagon has six sides. You might not be familiar with the, the prefix hepta. Um, but that means seven. Octa, an octagon, like a stop sign, eight sides. Nona means nine. Deca means ten. Um, IUPAC uses the Greek pre prefix inea for nine, but we don't do that in the United States. We use nona. Nona, nine. Oh, I forgot something. Um, the prefix mono is not used on the first element, and it's often emitted on the second element. This just falls into line with the chemist's bias against the number one. It extends to the prefix for one. We just avoid it if we can. So let's do some examples. This group of compounds, students find the easiest. And then they try to use this system to name everything in the the gate into trouble. But. So here we have Cl2O5. Look at the first element. Is it a metal? No. Here's the second element. It's not a metal either. There's only two, met two elements, and they are non-metals. That means we can use prefixes. How many chlorines are there? Two. The prefix for two is di. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to name this dichlorine. Dichlorine, 
And then I've got five oxygens. What's the prefix for five? Penta. Penta. And then I'm going to take the name oxygen, and I'm going to change the ending to ide. So dichlorine pentaoxide. I am not going to make a big deal out of this. Sometimes when you get a prefix ending with a vowel and an element name beginning with a vowel and you get these two vowels up against each other, sometimes we drop that last vowel on the, on the prefix. So if you see that, that's what's going on. Um, there's not a great rule that I can give you to tell you when to do that and when not to. People tend to disagree about it. So I'm not going to try to trick you. Um, BR308, what should we name that? Tribromine. And what's the prefix for eight? Octa oxide. Octaoxide. It's like, yeah, that might be one where they'll go and call it octoxide. That sounds weird, too. I would accept either of those as correct. On a multiple choice exam, which is what I give you, I would not put both of you those and expect you to choose one. I would give you one or the other, and then I'd give you some others that were more wrong, right? Like, try try bromine, you know, heptaoxide. Well, that's the wrong prefix. Or bromine oxide. Well, you left off all the prefixes, that sort of thing. This looks like if six. What should we name that? Iodine hexafluoride. Hexa is the prefix for six. Fluorine, and we change the ending to fluoride. There is one iodine, but it's the first element. So we omit mono. We're not going to call it monoiodine hexafluoride. I won't try to trick you on that one either. Any questions so far? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the eyed ending um, just kind of points out that this is a compound. I'm not just listing some elements and I forgot my commas. Um, when these are getting together in a compound, you know, I think of the ionic compounds as, as like a guy and a girl getting married and the woman changes her name. Well, here you've got two nonmetals getting married, I guess. And the second one, the more feminine one, changes her name. It will always end in ide for the molecular compounds. Yep. Any other questions? So what, this last one, P4S10, what's that one going to be? Tetraphosphorus. What's the prefix for 10? Deca. Deca sulfide. OK. There's a particular order that these elements are listed in, but it's given to you. If you're given the formula, you just do the same order for the name. If you're given the name, you write the elements in the same order. So it's good to know that there's a reason behind that, but in practice, it just doesn't come into it very much. So let's go the other way. Here are names, write the formulas. Well, when we're looking at names of compounds, we need to be able to recognize what kind of a compound it is. Um, the biggest giveaway in, in compounds like this when you see those Greek prefixes all over the place, this is a binary molecular compound. The other clue is this first name is referring to a nonmetal. 
that also tells you this is binary molecular. So diphosphorus, which um, there's a typo in here. Oops. Phosphorus, this is the British spelling. I don't know how that got in there. I did misspell phosphorus for oh, about a decade before I realized, oh, wait a minute, there's no O in there. Diphosphorus, how many phosphorus atoms? Two. So P2 pentasulfide, S5. Doesn't that seem a lot easier than the ionic compounds? That's why students try to use it all over the place. Tetraiodine. I4. I always put, um, I don't know what those are called, if they're serifs or what, but I put the horizontal lines on my capital I's. Have I shown you this? What is that? Is that an I, an L, or a 1? Hard to tell. So handwriting, I, I always do it this way, just to avoid confusion. Nona oxide, O9. How about carbon monoxide? CO. Sometimes mono is left out for the second element as well. And sometimes it isn't. And I don't expect you to know when it would be left out or not. Here we use carbon monoxide. We use the mono because there's also carbon dioxide. And if we said carbon oxide, it might not be clear which one we were talking about. How about sulfur hexafluoride? SF6. Any questions?